So this morning we are going to be in Philippians session 19. Uh, I was really planning on trying to polish off the book of Philippians this morning, but it was it was really bad. I actually began working on the sermon assuming that we'd be finishing the book, and so then I had to uh, redo about half of it, <laughs> one in the morning. It was awesome. So we are going to be covering four verses, verses 10 through 13, and then next week we will surely, Lord willing, cover the final uh, 10 verses or what have you. So as anyone knows who spends time in their Bible, you know, the Apostle Paul went through some uh, difficult times, right? And I think that's probably the, the understatement of the year. <laughs> Paul went through crazy times, as you guys know. You know, when Paul got saved, uh, God literally talked to the first Christian who met the newly saved Paul and told him about how much Paul was going to suffer for Christ. So imagine, right, you get saved and then uh, God goes and tells the first Christian, other Christian you're going to meet, how much you're going to suffer for Jesus. (laughs) You're like, oh, sweet. So yeah, Paul definitely suffered quite a bit for his his faith in Christ, and we see talk we see Paul talk about that suffering pretty regularly in the pages of the New Testament. If you guys read your Bible in the epistles, you'll see quite a bit of him discussing uh, the craziest ad, the crazy adventures and all the craziness that he goes through. And uh, that makes sense because suffering is part of the Christian life, and not just the Christian life, but every life. You know, we all suffer. And yet, as hard as suffering is, suffering isn't the greatest enemy of the Christian life, of the Christian walk. Comfort is. So this is kind of uh, confusing, right? Because suffering is so hard, and so few of us want to go through it, and yet it's not the thing that derails most people. Most people are derailed through comfort, You know, you look at the persecuted church, and the persecuted church is suffering tremendously, and yet they're killing it, right? Their walk is fantastic. They're doing great. They're walking closely with the Lord in the midst of the trials. It's not the persecuted church that is not doing so well. It is the comfortable church that's not doing so well. You know, comfort, if we're not careful, leads to complacency, and, um, you know, we let our guard down and uh, we begin to foolishly think everything is okay and we're safe and we can relax. And we forget that the Bible tells us that the adversary is like a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. We forget that, you know. And when we're dealing with hard times, it's usually pretty easy to remember that we have an enemy, you know, that we need to depend on Jesus. You know, when we're living paycheck to paycheck, we often have to trust God to make ends meet, right? But when we're doing good financially or things are going well in life, it's easy to trust in the comfortable circumstances or in the the money that's coming in to handle any of the problems that we might encounter. You know, our family has been pretty, pretty poor and our family has been pretty wealthy, And I can honestly tell you guys that it's not the poor, the poverty, that's the the most dangerous times. It's the it's the ease, it's the comfort, it's the wealth. You know, it's uh and and to be clear, they're both very taxing. You know, if you've been in abject poverty, we haven't. It's American poverty, right? But it's still not easy, you know. It's it's a difficult thing. It's easier to stay close to Jesus when you're poor because then you got to depend on him for every bill and every time rent becomes due and it's the, you know, two days or a day before the day of your late fee for the rent, you know, and you're like, I don't have the money, you know, or every time the kids need new clothes or, you know, when the dog needs food because he's thin and getting malnutrition from eating human food. Turns out dogs don't do well on potatoes and rice and eggs and you can't, it turns out that does not work. And, you know, it's, it's difficult when you're, when you're poor in terms of life, but it's easy to stay closer to the Lord when you're not doing well financially because then you got to depend on him for everything and you can't just run to money. You know, I can remember 
praying for groceries. I remember one time right after we arrived out in New York uh, to plant the first church that we ever planted, and uh, we had no food. We were eating canned food for breakfast and these kinds of things. I think my wife was making like quinoa or something like, I don't even know, it was like rice for breakfast. <laughs> I was like, this is going to be great. And I was in my office praying that the Lord would provide food. And uh, what the one person that we met, we didn't really know anybody, but one of the brothers who was of a Calvary Chapel background in the area he uh, had basically went to their version of the Bible college out there, and uh, one of the regional pastors put him in contact with us when he heard we were getting called out to that area to start a church, and he was super excited and everything because there's been no, you know, not a lot of light shining in that darkness. Uh, Buffalo, the whole metro in that area is like 1.3 million people, and there was one Calvary Chapel that was there for 20 years or something. It had like 30, 40, 50 people throughout the years. And then there had been like eight or nine or 10 or something attempted church plants that had all failed. We didn't know that at the time. Uh, so we went out there and we're like, all right, let's do this. And we had no food and I was praying. And all of a sudden, while I'm praying, I hear a knock on the door of my of the little tiny room that you couldn't even fit in a bed. It was so small and it was my wife. She's like, someone's someone's in the driveway. <laughs> I was like, went out there and it was the, the guy that had, we had just met and he had, I guess the Lord told him to bring us groceries. And we're like, that was the Lord. <laughs> sure enough, you know, you know, you're poor when you're transferring the same bar of soap from the kitchen into the bathroom. You're like, this is the soap. This is it. Like, you move that soap around the house. You know, we were eating at food pantries and these kinds of things. You know, we were definitely not balling. <laughs> we were not rich. And when you're poor and you need something, you know, you fall, you fall on your knees and pray. And when you're rich, the temptation is to pull out your wallet and pay. Right. So you it's it's easy. It's the human nature tendency to depend on the money instead of depending on the Lord. And there will be times in your life when you're doing great and things are easy. And there'll be times in your life when you're struggling to get by, you know, day by day. And it's important to remember that the one is just as dangerous, if not more dangerous spiritually. You know, Israel failed in both situations. Right. And if we're not careful, we too will fail in both situations. Israel failed in the hardship of the wilderness when they failed to trust God and started complaining and doubting, right? That was like them being poor. That was like the hard times. But they also failed when they came into the promised land, right? And there was abundance and things were easy. And they had these vineyards that the Bible says they didn't plant and these houses that they didn't build and these kinds of things. And the one is just as dangerous, if not more dangerous than the other. It's hard to be poor, but then at least you have to trust in God. But when you're rich and you're doing great and you have need of nothing, that's a dangerous place to be in because then the tendency is to say, oh, I'm good, God. I got, I got this. I'm good. And then you start to talk to God a lot less, right? Because you don't need so much from him. What a shallow version of Christianity we often employ, huh? Where we talk to God and uh, type in the numbers on the ATM when we need the money. Like, hello, God, I need some money. You know, hello, God, I need this. Hello, God, I need that. What kind of relationship is that? How many of you guys want to be in that kind of relationship? How many of you guys only want to hear from your spouse or your child when they need something? Honey, do. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw the funniest uh, thing ever. It was like a little video of a guy retired, and it was just he, his wife had just like a never ending list of chores. By the end of it, he's like, I'm going back to work. At least I get sick days, I get paid, and I get appreciated. I'm busier now at home now that I've retired. He's like, I'm going back to work. This is terrible. But, you know, it's, it's we don't want to be like that with God, right? We don't want to be a fair weather friend where we only come around when we need something. You think that's the kind of worship that God desires of you? Do you think that's the kind of relationship the Lord wants from you? Terrifying, right? And yet that's the tendency. And it's even worse when we're rich because then we don't need anything and we don't come around. We're like, oh, I'm good now. Thanks, Lord. Take care. It's, it's, a, it's a scary thing. It's a dangerous thing. There's danger in both abundance and in lack. And that's going to be at the heart of this morning's text, trusting God and walking closely with God, whether times are tough or whether times are good. And I think that's a hugely important 
uh, message that the church needs to hear, not just our church, but every church. You know, it's so often we like these uh, exciting messages where we talk about these sensational topics that are clickbait, but the reality is the Christian church is a mile wide and an inch deep because it doesn't press in. It doesn't focus on the fundamentals. It doesn't focus on the meat and bones of the gospel. We got to get into the nitty gritty. We got to cover the stuff like this because this is how your Christian life works. And if you don't know these things and you don't apply these things and you don't care about these things, then your Christian walk is going to be dismal. It's going to be pathetic. And that's exactly what we see when we look around the landscape today. The church is not doing so great. But these are the kind of things, these are the essentials that we need to put into practice in our lives if we want our Christian walk to be successful. So, you know, some people think about it like this, and this will probably be some of you guys here in this room, and I'm not trying to throw punches here. I'm just being honest. And I think at some point, all of us have fallen into one of these two categories, but some people only walk closely with God when things are going bad. Now, if that's the case, do you think God is going to be wanting your life to go well if you only walk close to him when your life is going bad? He loves you enough that he won't let your life go well because then you walk away from him. You're going to keep having to play that level again. And the converse, the opposite is also true. Some of us only walk closely with God when we're doing well. So some of us, it's the opposite, right? If things are going good, we're like, oh, the God loves me. And then they start to go bad and God hates me, obviously, you know, so he wouldn't let this happen to me. (laughs) We don't want to be either of those. We don't want to only walk closely with God when we're doing poorly, you know, financially or whatever, and we need him. And so then we talk to him a lot, then we pray a lot, then we press in. But we also don't want the opposite to be true where we only walk closely with God when everything's easy. Oh, God likes me now. I'm doing well. Everything's good. Oh, things aren't going so well. God doesn't love me anymore, clearly. He didn't give me uh, the Lamborghini that I prayed for. And if he really loved me, I would be driving that Tesla, of course, duh, right? And that's, you know, a very shallow, a very uh, pathetic, a very immature version of Christianity. We need to run to God during the hard times, but also when things go well. We need to run to him all the time. And so if we start to walk away from the Lord and fall into sin every time we start to do well, or we start to bitterly complain and grumble and, you know, get discouraged and not have faith and trust the Lord's promises when things go bad, either case is not a good situation. And that pretty much guarantees that in your life, you're going to continue to play that level again. And so that thing that you hate the most, you're going to keep banging your head against that wall until you just open the door with your hand instead of trying to stick your head through the wall. Because, I mean, God loves you guys too much to let you be successful and ignore him or to, you know, to get to that point where you think you're good. Oh, I'm good now. I needed God when I was, you know, when things were hard, but I'm fine now. I don't need God. Thanks, God. Take care. See you next time. He loves you guys too much to let you go down that road. If you're his children, he's going to discipline you. The Bible is very clear about this. When you're at the grocery store and you hear a kid screaming and freaking out and raising a stink and making a scene, do you go spank them? You might want to, but you don't, right? That's not your child. But when you're the Lord's child, he's going to discipline you. He's going to spank you. And so he loves you guys too much to let things go well for you when every time they do, you walk away from him. And, you know, he's going to continue to be like, hey, flicking you right like hey what are you doing you're gonna have to continue to play that level again and again and again and it is no fun and not to mention it's just not beneficial you guys want to mature you want to grow in christ you want to be conformed into his image and the only way that happens is if you're picking up what he's laying down if you're reading your bible and spending time in the word and fellowshipping and actually growing Not just dealing with the same struggles, the same doubts, the same sins, the same tendencies over and over and over again. It's been said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And yet that's so often the average Christian life. 
where you just keep on. You're like, I don't know why this ain't working. You're like, you're putting a square peg in a round hole, man. It ain't ever happening. And yet you keep trying. And God loves you guys. And he'll keep you playing that level till you learn that lesson. Because he loves you guys that much. So this morning, we're going to be talking about these kinds of things and how to overcome this kind of spiritual maturity, immaturity, and how we can how we can avoid repeating these same mistakes and mature to the point where we stay close to Jesus, whether times are good or whether times are bad. Because the last thing we want is to be stuck playing the level over and over again. So let's start off by reading this morning's text, verses 10 through 13 in Philippians chapter 4. And then we'll start to break it down. So Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, we read, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Pretty foundational passage, right? I think we all know the t-shirt verse there at the end, right? The coffee mug verse. We love that verse. We don't so much like the part before it. Uh, Usually you'll see the uh, feel-good Christianity people quote that verse in a way that directly contradicts what's right before it. You know, I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Uh, They're saying that because they're like, I reject this suffering. I will not go through this. I do not receive this. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul's like, yeah, all things meant going through that suckage. And they're like, no, I reject that suckage. I will not go through that. Uh, That is like the satanic commandment, right? Uh, It's so bad. Um, I don't remember if it was Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland or one of those forums for one of those guys' ministries. It was a big, I'm not trying to punch down here, but it was a big like Pentecostal chat forum. And they were all posting the verses. They're like, let's post some verses that we love that, you know, that encourage us. And so they were all posting verses and a biblical Christian was in there just like, this is insane. And he posted, uh, worship me and all of this will be yours. And it's like hundreds of likes. Everybody's like, I love, I claim this verse. That's Satan. Yeah. Satan said that. Be very careful. There's one guy in the book who promises you everything. If you worship him, uh, that's the devil. And he uh, does not keep his word. Ask Janet Joplin, uh, Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison or you know, anybody else who sold their soul and then promptly died at 27 or whatever, you know, all these different kinds. Of, <laughs> nope, he's not your buddy. He ain't going to keep you his, his part of the bargain. We always tell people when the devil invites you over for dinner, you're not the guest of honor. You're the main course. And it's important to remember that. You know, we need to recognize that that verse there at the end that we'll talk about more as we go through it, it's not in the context of like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't need to go through this trial. I reject that. I do not receive that. No, it's the exact opposite. Paul's like, I can go through suffering. I know how to be hungry. I know how to suffer need. I know how to be insulted and attacked by people, abased, right? He's like, I know how to do that because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. (laughs) It's like the way we apply that verse is the 180 opposite of that. But no, that's what that verse is actually talking about. And so we want to make sure that we actually understand what the Bible is teaching. That's why it's so important that we read through the entire Bible verse by verse and make sense of it. Like we read in, I think it's Nehemiah 8.8, 8, where the job of the pastor is essentially to read the word and make sense of it. So... You know, let's let's look at, we'll start with, we'll divide it in half, basically. We'll start with verses 10 and 11. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though surely you did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So we know from history that this church in Philippi was not a huge church uh, around this time, especially. Uh, estimates range from 25 people, like, you know, to maybe a hundred people. So small church, not a huge church, but we do know that they were, you know, supporting Paul as a missionary when they were able, which apparently was only occasionally because 
for some reason, they didn't seem to have a lot of money. Uh, they didn't seem to have the financial wherewithal to be able to support Paul consistently in his missionary activities. But the cool thing we see here is that Paul wasn't dependent on receiving financial support in order to do what God told him to do. And that's a good lesson for us, guys, because God doesn't call you to do something he won't enable you to do. This is very important in the context of Calvinism, where God calls all men everywhere to repent. <laughs> Psych, you're not able to. I, sorry, but you're response able, even though you're able to not respond. How's that for some uh, mental jujitsu there? Like, yeah, I don't know how that works. God's like, repent. I did not make you able to. You are not able to respond, but you are responsible for your sins. Enjoy hell. You're like, wait, what, wait, what? What just happened? Welcome to Calvinism. Enjoy. So yeah, no, God will tell you to do something and he'll enable you to do it. So Paul really wasn't concerned about whether or not he had the money to live comfortably. You know, he trusted that God would provide and God did provide. And so Paul wasn't tripping one way or the other when he didn't have financial support. He wasn't able to do as much ministry, which is something that we can all, if we're in ministry and we don't draw a salary like Pastor Steve and I don't, we can relate to that. You know, I don't, we don't get much in the way of support. And so we have to work, you know, we have to do these kinds of things and it does take away from ministry time. But, you know, Paul wasn't seeking to be comfortable so much as he was looking to be effective for Christ. And, you know, that kind of fortitude doesn't come naturally to us where we're like mission minded and we're not so much worried about being comfortable so much as we are about finishing the mission. That kind of fortitude does not come naturally to us. You know, it's a it's an admirable quality, you know, determination, that focus. But that's got to be learned. Uh, For those of you who have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, your children don't come out of the womb, uh, chivalrous and respectful and polite. Uh, you beat that into them. So the Bible's very clear. Yeah. You spank them, you discipline them, you correct them. The Bible's literally like reproof, you know, discipline the child, beat the child. He will not die. It's like, why do you hate your child? Why aren't you beating him? This is what the Bible says. I know this is so politically incorrect in our culture today. Uh, but yeah, how's that working since we've stopped doing that? Our culture is a uh, stick a fork in it. It's done. So, yeah, I mean, that's clearly biblical and it's clearly demonstrably accurate. When we look around the world today and we see the insanity, the wholesale insanity in our culture today where we've removed all forms of accountability and discipline and these kinds of things. And we're reaping the what is it? sow to the wind, reap the whirlwind. Yeah, we're doing it. That's got to be learned. Discipline. Determination, fortitude, focus, these kinds of things, they have to be learned. And that's often a very painful process. You know, it's difficult to learn these kinds of mistakes. You know, sometimes we'll joke when our kids will do something dumb. Well, they'll never do that again, right? Because there's some things like, oh, yeah, stick, your, stick, that, uh, stick that staple on the electrical socket. You'll only do that once. You know, it's never doing that again. Ouch, right? Lick, lick the batteries, like a nine volt battery. You're like, yeah, never doing that again. You learn your lesson, right? You're like, oh, the stove is hot. Mommy and daddy were correct. That checked out. Stove is hot. You know, you, these are, we learn these things. It's, it's uh, sometimes uh, tuition is a painful fee. You know, in the Christian life, we got to remember it's a battle. And unfortunately, it's often a war of attrition. It wears you down. It tires you. It beats you down. And you can either let that overwhelm you or overtake you, which is what happens when you're trying to live the Christian life in your own strength, you know, or you can overcome by not trying to live the Christian life in your own strength, but rather instead counting it all as loss and reckoning the old man dead and allowing Christ to strengthen you and to live through you. These are the two choices that you have in the Christian life. You can either try to do it in your own strength, good luck with that, or you can just lay it all down. We're supposed to be on the altar for Jesus Christ, laying our lives down on the altar. How many of you guys have ever barbecued something? Okay, now imagine sticking half of it in the barbecue and half of it out of the barbecue. How would that work? 
it would look pretty pathetic by the end, right? You'd be like, this thing is like ting, 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 like black and crispy. This is raw. This is, what's that good for? The dog, right? Trash, throw it away. It's just, you ruin that. And that's the Christian life when you're halfway on the altar. And, you know, you're like, I am miserable. Everybody's like, yeah, you look pretty miserable. <laughs> you look pretty bad. It looks like you're not long for this earth, man. Yeah, it'll kill you. It'll drive you crazy trying to live the Christian life in your own strength. It does not work. The only way you're ever going to find contentment and fulfillment and happiness in this life is by finding your joy and your peace and your purpose and even your life in Jesus Christ rather than in the circumstances and in the the things going on in your day-to-day life because those things, they go up, they go down, things go good, things go bad. And if you're trying to find your happiness in those things rather than in Jesus, you're going to go up, you're going to go down, you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad. It's not going to work. And that's actually what the Bible says in the next verse. Take a look at verses 12 and 13. Paul says, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned, see there it is again, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the only way it works, like we just said, is when we find our strength, our purpose, our hope, our identity, everything in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we're going to be able to say what Paul says here. Like, I know how to do great. I know how to be attacked. I know how to be hungry. I know how to be full. I know how to suffer need, and I know how to have abundance. The only way we're ever going to be able to agree with Paul in these things is if we agree with what he says there at the end, where we can do all things when it's Christ who strengthens us, not when our bank account is full, not when things are going our way, or when, you know, everything is peachy keen. No, that's not when things are going to work well. Things are going to work well when we're finding our hope, our purpose, our strength, our identity, our joy, everything in Jesus Christ. Being abased or treated poorly, it's pretty difficult, especially when the context is Christian service like Paul here is talking about. You know, by and large, people are usually pretty kind to those who are in Christian ministry pastors, whatever, missionaries, whatever it may be, people are usually pretty kind to those to those who are in active full-time Christian ministry uh, until they're not. <laughs> you know, Paul references his mistreatment numerous times in his New Testament writings, and that's Paul. And so, obviously, Jesus was even more uh, miserably treated, right? He was regularly attacked, he was slandered, he was treated terribly. So, of course, it makes sense that those of us who are called into pastoral ministry or whatever kind of ministry that God calls you into would face the same kind of treatment. You know, and we have, you know, this is the reality. We've been slandered. We've been lied about. We've been attacked uh, both by fellow Christians who we've poured our lives out to in ministry and ministering to them, but also from fellow workers and men that we put into ministry. And Paul talks about that same thing in chapter two of Philippians, right? We've gone over it before. Paul talked about how there were other pastors at the time who were preaching the gospel, hoping to add affliction to his chains. (laughs) Sweet, right? You get to heaven and you're like, all right, Lord, I did great in my ministry. God's like, says here you uh, were really into attacking Paul. (laughs) Yeah, that guy's a dirtbag. Did he even make it? Uh, He he wrote uh, about half of the New Testament. Oh, (laughs) Uh, uh, did I make it? (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, this is the reality, guys. This is very, very hard. And I think that should be obvious to us if Paul's talking about these things. And the Bible's clear. You know, this one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind and pressing on towards the high calling that we have in Christ Jesus. But at the same time, we do see Paul talk about these things, uh, not only to warn those of us who will one day be in ministry, but because that's kind of how we process things as humans, right? We have to, like, deal with it. We bring it to the Lord. We, you know, warn our fellow workers about the same kinds of things. That's biblical. There's nothing wrong with that kind of thing. But Paul didn't make it his mission in life to avenge himself, did he? 
He just gave it to the Lord. He warned his fellow brothers, like, this stuff's going to happen. You know, this has happened to me. You know, these people are trying to destroy my life. You know, these people hate me. These people have slandered me. You know, all these kinds of things. But Paul didn't say, and therefore, I've stopped my third missionary journey to go back and go kill a couple people because these people, they are out of control. And I'm sure the Lord's with me. These guys are totally unbiblical. Yeah, Paul did not do that. Uh, he did not open a website or an online discernment ministry where all he did was slander other ministries. Yeah, internet, I'm talking to you. Like that's huge, right? That's a that's a huge thing. There's actual a group of ministries called online discernment ministries, who aren't focused on preaching Jesus Christ. They're focused on exposing false teaching. Like okay, that's part of what we do, but that's not all that we do. The main thing must always be the main thing, and that is preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't, you know, talk about false teachings because there are many false teachers and false teachings. But that's to say that shouldn't be our focus. And we shouldn't be, you know, doing ad hominem attacks and slander and insinuation and these kinds of things. Like just if there's something, sure, there's if there's something there, you're like, this guy said this in this message. That's unbiblical. Okay, cool. That's great. You know, or whatever. This guy had an affair and cheated on his wife and they got divorced and now he remarried his secretary. That's biblical. To call it out, be like, hey, that's completely unbiblical. The Bible says, no, you can't marry, you can't divorce your wife and then marry your secretary. That's not how that works. You know, you can't, like we see going on all throughout Calvary Chapel now, teach that homosexuality is okay as long as you're celibate. No, we're new creations in Christ. That's not how that works. That's unbiblical. And the funniest thing on that note is, you know what happens when you don't tell people that's an option? That they can still stay homosexual, just be celibate? You know what happens when you don't teach them that? They don't do that. They just are new creations in Christ, and they get saved, and God changes them and fixes them. Unless you tell them that you can continue in your sin. Isn't that tragic? Because we've seen homosexual people come out of that and get saved, radically changed, then get married, have normal lives. Why wouldn't we want that? Why would we instead be like, it turns out your sin's actually okay. You're good to go. But I've digressed. No, our focus needs to always be on Jesus Christ preaching him. Because that's the only way people get saved, right? People aren't getting saved while we attack others. That's why Paul didn't get distracted off of his mission. He instead stayed focused preaching Jesus Christ. Sure, he would talk about the attacks time to time. He even named names. Beware of Alexander the Coppersmith. This dude's done me great harm, right? He was all about that. But his ministry was always focused on preaching Jesus Christ. And he was attacked unimaginably all the time. Constantly, Paul was attacked. You see it when you actually read his writings and pay attention to what he's saying. He's constantly like getting slandered, being attacked. Some people are like, Paul's not a real apostle. <laughs> what do we call him today? Paul the right, Paul the apostle. Yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> Paul's not a real apostle. He's like, okay. He's so he's so humble. He's like, but even if I'm not, I surely am to you. <laughs> so, like so humble. Like yeah, he really was an apostle. So, yeah, people get it wrong. And, you know, it's to say it's hard is an understatement, guys, especially when the urge, the temptation is to defend yourself. In our culture, the commonly held assumption is that there are essentially two groups of people who do not defend themselves, the cowardly and the guilty. Right? That's pretty much the way our culture looks at it, right? There's two groups of people who don't defend themselves, the cowardly and the guilty. And if you're not defending yourself, you're either guilty or you're a coward. Is that biblical? As Christians, we're supposed to be Christ-like. Church, when Jesus was accused, did he defend himself? He opened not his mouth. When he was asked a direct question, then he responded. And that's the, that's the method that we've taken. You know, if someone asks us something, we'll answer them. But our ministry is not to defend ourselves. Our ministry is to preach Christ and him crucified. And if you're too dumb to do what the Bible says and look at the fruit, I don't know what to tell you. If you're too dumb to not recognize the Bible tells you to receive not an accusation against an elder, which is a pastor, except by the mouth of two or more accusers, no witnesses. Big difference, huh? 
A lot of people can accuse. A lot of people can insinuate. But guess what the Bible says you're supposed to go by? The mouth of witnesses, not accusers. You know what the word receive means? It means even listen to. You're not even supposed to listen to an accusation against a pastor or an elder unless it comes by the mouth of two or more witnesses, not accusers. How are we doing with that in the church today? Fantastic. Like Billy Graham when he's talking to Richard Schuler, and he's like, there's a broadness to heaven. Fantastic, Billy. We can all go to heaven even if we've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Fantastic. Broad is the way. He literally said that. I'm like, there's a verse that says broad is the way. Uh, it's not into heaven. It's into hell. Like, yeah, this is, this is false. There's false teachings out there. We want to call them out. But that's when we're hearing it from the horse's mouth. If there's something that someone's done and you can find it in their message and like, this is total heresy, by all means, be like, that's heresy, you know? Or, you know, you got something where this, like, this person's like, I did the financial books. This pastor was stealing money. And then, like, yeah, we had a lot of it. Another person's like, yeah, he was stealing money. Like, okay, cool. Like, go to the cops. Let's do this. Like, Absolutely. You know, what's the Bible say? Like, pay it back 10 times. Put him in jail and make him pack it to pay back, whatever, right? But when it was just like insinuation and slander, which is the kind of stuff that Paul was usually dealing with and the kind of stuff that most pastors have to deal with, like that's, who, who do you think that's from? From Jesus? <laughs> no. Smite the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. We've seen that many times, haven't we? Because Satan does not regard the sheep. We had one guy who was doing totally unbiblical stuff, and he says, oh, the sheep will be fine. It's been revealed. We're like, they all jumped off the cliff after you did what you did, brother. Like, oh, most of them still haven't gone back to church. Like, you've done well. Well done, Satan said. Yeah, I mean, you can see whose fingerprints are all over that. We need to make sure, though, that our ministry is focusing on Jesus Christ. It's hard. The temptation is to defend yourself, to attack back. In our culture, people think you're guilty, right? If you don't respond, oh, you're guilty, or you're a coward. Either way, cowards have their part in the lake of fire. Let's get them. And if you don't defend yourself, then people think that you're guilty, right? They think that you're a coward. And yet Jesus, he opened not his mouth. And if we as maturing Christians truly want to know the fellowship of his suffering, Guys, we must not only suffer under false accusations, we must also learn not to attack back and defend ourselves. That's hard. Because knowing the fellowship of his suffering doesn't just mean that you're suffering for wrong, being wronged, you know, being lied about, whatever, being suffering just because of your faith in Christ or serving Christ or whatever. It doesn't just mean that. And you'll hear it often taught that way. Oh, I'm suffering for Jesus. I know the fellowship of his suffering. Really? Because you spent all day trying to defend yourself. No. Knowing the fellowship of Christ's suffering is suffering wrongly for the gospel and then not defending yourself, but continuing to do what your boss told you to do. Acts chapter 20, Paul's giving his, what he believes is his valedictory speech there, right? On the shores of Miletus, talking to the Ephesian elders, and he goes through all this craziness. He's like, yeah, and none of these things move me, and nor do I count my life dear to myself that I may finish the ministry that Jesus has given me to preach the gospel. That's our ministry. We need to learn not to attack back, not to defend ourselves. And again, I'm not saying we can't respond when directly asked, right, like Jesus did. At one point, we have uh, him injured under the name of, like, put under oath under God's name, and he says, are you the son of God, right? Are you the Christ? He answers at that point, right? He answers. That's okay. It's, It's okay to answer when you're directly asked something. But notice Jesus didn't stand there in front of Pilate, in front of Herod, and be like, all right, now I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes defending myself. No, it's not what he did, because that's not our mission. And as Christians, we're Christ-like. We're supposed to do what Jesus did. We have the little bracelets. What would Jesus do? Yeah, probably not what you're doing. You know, if you can't find it in the Bible, probably not biblical. The reality, church, is this. Satan would love nothing more than for you to spend less, less time preaching Christ and more time defending yourself. If you're Satan, that's a good deal, right? So if you're Satan, you're going to do everything you can to do whatever you can to make sure this person stops preaching Jesus and starts defending themselves, right? So that's why Satan loves to do this stuff. 
It not only sows discord among the brethren when the Lord told us to focus on unity, but it also makes it so that we get distracted from our main mission, which is to preach the gospel. Think of it like we're firefighters and the building's on fire, and we're out there with the hoses spraying God's word, spraying, right, trying to get people saved and trying to put the fire out, and then Satan releases a bunch of murder hornets. And we're just like, ah! But the reality is, no, we need to just sit there and let them sting us and continue focusing on the mission. And that sucks. But you know what else sucks? Getting distracted from our mission. We can't do it. Souls are in the balance. He's made us ambassadors. So our job is to plead with men to be reconciled to God. It's so important, guys. We can't defend ourselves. We're slaves. Is our job to defend ourselves or to do what the master said? Our safety, our survival, our defense, is that our job or our master's job as slaves? We shouldn't be defending ourselves. We should let our master defend us. God says it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Do we really believe that? Who's going to handle it better, you or God? For sure, right? God's going to handle it better. And so this is not our job to defend ourselves, guys. Our job is to preach Jesus Christ. And as we grow in Christ, in Christ, we're conformed into the image of Jesus. And then we learn not only how to abound or have abundance, but also how to be abased or brought low. You know, how to suffer for Jesus Christ without losing hope or allowing it to consume us and make us bitter or distract you away from your mission of preaching Jesus Christ. Our goal is to, by the end of all this craziness, guys, be able to say what Paul says, I know how to be abound, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. And then he tells us in the second half of verse 12, he says, everywhere and on all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The test of wealth, the test of poverty, guys, they're both very difficult. And they're both equally difficult if we want to be honest. And our culture would get so offended at us saying that, right? They'd be like, that's so insensitive to say that a rich person has the same test as a really poor person. Well, God's fair, right? Right? God doesn't give everybody like, God's not trying to have you fail, right? God wants to save you. He wants to have you come to faith in him. You know, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God wills that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. His goal is not for you to fail. His goal, to, his goal is for you to succeed. So we can say with all honesty that the test of wealth and the test of poverty are equally difficult tests. And, you know, our minds, our culture obviously recoils at that insensitivity, insensitivity of such an assertion, right? But the data doesn't lie. The wealthy have higher suicide rates, higher depression rates, higher divorce rates, you name it. So if anything, wealth is actually the harder test. Jesus says, hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. Church, is Jesus exaggerating or lying? No, if you want to emphasize something the most that you possibly can in Hebrew, you repeat it. You know what he does when he says that? He repeats it. It's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. It's a crazy thought. The test of wealth is a very subtle, very tempting, and very alluring and difficult test. The desire for wealth is... Or at least the comfort and stability that it brings calls and beckons every single one of us. We can't even lie. It's real. Everybody has that desire to be comfortable and for things to be easy. This is totally normal. In a bad way, not a good way. A central aspect of this test we call life, indeed our very human nature, is to desire to gain what we do not have and struggle to hold on to what we do have. Yeah, that's part of our human nature, guys. And a central tenet of the Christian life is to, as we grow and mature in Christ, learn how to let go of these things 
that our sin nature so desperately wants us to cling to. And to then instead desire Christ over all the things, all the treasures of this life. Think of the different types of soil that represent the people who are interested in Jesus and you know make a commitment to Jesus, not necessarily saved, but three out of four of that group don't make it. You know, one just the enemy comes and drags them off right when they get saved. Another one, it's persecution. When things get hard, they get going, right? But that third one, it's the desire for wealth and the distraction of other things. That's crazy, right? That drags off a lot of people. And as we grow in Christ, we learn to desire him over all the things, over all the treasures of this life. And it's all in that simple, beautiful, childlike faith, not childish faith. We just believe it. Jesus says it. I believe it. That settles it. Like that redneck t-shirt we were talking about back in the day. It's, It's so true, right? If we only accept something that we understand, we cannot claim to be Christians. It would be our name ism, right? Jason ism. I believe what I can understand. If I don't get it, I don't believe it. That means you're resting in your own understanding. The Bible says rest not on your own understanding. Because guess what? You're not God. You're never going to figure it all out. That doesn't mean to study to show yourself approved and a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth or, you know, being ready to have to every give to every man an answer of the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. You should do those things. But to think that you're smart enough that you're going to understand everything, that's prideful. Yeah, good luck with that. That ain't going to happen. Or at least when you're, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, you might not. But maybe you will be comfortable with your level of understanding after you've been a a Christian for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. That's a whole different proposition. But to think that we should understand everything and that we're not going to accept it unless we understand it is the height of the rejection of God. Because then all you're doing is receiving what you understand. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're saved by God's grace through faith. And if we lack faith, we're not saved. It's that simple. It's all about a relationship with God. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is how it works, guys. This is the the meat and bones of it. This is the central uh, teaching of Christianity, faith in Jesus Christ. We got to trust in him. We want that simple, beautiful, childlike faith. Not resting in our own understanding, but resting in Jesus Christ, knowing that we can't do it, but Jesus can, and Jesus will, and Jesus did, and that we can do all things when it's Christ who strengthens us and not things going well in life or whatever it may be. Then the adventure truly begins, that wonderful and beautiful and terrible adventure that we call the Christian life content, full of joy and hope and peace and love, whether we're abounding and things are going well or whether we're being abused and abased and lied about and slandered because it's no longer us living to ourselves, but it's us living in and through and for Jesus Christ. We can do all things when it's him who strengthens us. And then we can go through the ups and through the downs and through the craziness and through the adventures and through the terrible times and everything else. Pastor Steve and I, when we talk to people about Christian ministry, we say it's awesome, beautiful, wonderful, terrible, horrifying, and adventurous. It's uh, join us. You know, come on in. The water's fine. They're like a shark is eating your arm. You're like it's great, yeah, but that's the reality. None of us make it out of here alive, guys. You can't save your life. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. But when you just roll with the punches and be like, you know what? Yeah, I'm being abased. I'm being slandered, whatever. I'm on the rack. Things are terrible right now, but it's not even worthy to be compared to what lies in store for us. And when we recognize Jesus is worth it, and we go through those things and we say, you know what? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worthy. Like John Chow right before he died. He's like, it's worth it. He's this missionary who got killed on the mission field. Last thing he wrote in his journal the day before he got killed was, Jesus is worth it. Is Jesus worth it to you? To be abased, to be attacked, to not just walk with him when things are easy, but also when things are hard or vice versa. 
still walk with him when things are easy. The only way you're ever going to do that is if it's you operating in Jesus Christ's strength. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, we pray that we would put this into practice in our lives, Lord, that whether things are good, whether things are bad, whether times are easy, whether times are hard, Lord, that we would continue to walk with you, Lord, finding our hope, our joy, our purpose, our strength in you. Because, Lord, we know that we can do all things when it's you who strengthens us. So, Lord, work in our lives and draw us close to you and help us to lay our lives down and to walk worthy of the calling that we have in you, Christ Jesus. And, Lord, we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have in Jesus' name. Amen. Did we just survive?